I would never want to be involved in politics, and I would, and as I've said this publicly, anybody who's prioritizing standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how can you, how can you get involved in an area where you're going to have to utter statements of kufr? Audhu billah. I would never encourage anybody who genuinely fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to get to that level. It's never worth it to compromise your deen mm -hmm. for the sake of a dunyawi maslaha. Never, never. Dr. Yasser Qadi, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, and welcome back to The Thinking Muslim. It's a pleasure to have you with us once again. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. It's a pleasure to be here. We had a good conversation last time, inshallah. Let's continue that, inshallah. We did. Well, look, Dr. Yasser, I really want to explore a very important theme today, that of Islam and political power. Now, we often declare that Islam is political. From its first moments, Islam was linked to a state-building process, and the Sharia explicitly addresses rules that can only be discharged by a government, such as the rules of hudud or the rules of apostasy. Imam Ghazali even linked the collection of zakah and the marriage contract contingent on having an Islamic government. I think it is not incorrect to argue that for a long duration of Islamic history, Muslims in the majority of Muslim countries have lived under Islamic caliphates or empires. Even those on the peripheries remain conscious of this political power intrinsic, uh, intrinsically linked to their faith. However, much of this is, is much of this less to do with religion and more to do with the circumstances early Muslims found themselves in. Is Islam wedded to its foundational moment, politics fused with a spiritual foundation? Many Muslim revivalist movements were established after the demise of the Ottomans, with varying degrees of success, possibly one may argue that ultimate success has eluded them. But the issue of political power remains a vexed one. Some have pursued programs that can only be described as authoritarian, building conceptions of state power and centralization that rarely existed in past eras. So how do we assess these programs? And relevant to us, there's the question of sizable Muslim minorities in the West, outside of the natural homelands. Can Muslims engage with political systems and ideologies that radically contravene Islamic tenets? And if this is necessary to our existence, do Muslims have to give up something in return? So there's a lot to get through. And I feel you have thought about these matters and I would like to hear your views and mm. stress test some of your conclusions in a respectful and robust way. I mean, to add my question to today come, inshallah, from a sincere place. I mean, I find myself agreeing with almost everything you say, but sometimes question uh, or query some of your political stances. So I would like to really get some clarification on mm. these. Now, firstly, I listen to and follow most of your lectures and khutbahs. And I feel you're attempting to work out many of these really difficult questions. Is that a fair summary of where you are? Or do you feel you have come to a concrete conclusion or a series of concrete conclusions on the general points I mentioned in my introduction about politics? Jayid, bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa wa alhamma ba'd. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify our hearts and to guide us to that which... Uh, is the truth and to guide us to the truth and be brave enough to speak the truth uh, even if it brings about the criticism of the critic um, as to your question about trying to figure out uh, the best way forward in this very complex unprecedented uh, political and uh, dare I say uh, religious situation and context we find ourselves in uh, I think that all of us really all of us are trying and in the end, perfection is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, we all have a role to play. And what I've been saying for quite a long time, you can't expect everybody to play the same role. You can't expect everybody to think along the same lines. And some diversity not only is inevitable, it is actually required and healthy. So let there be a spectrum of attempts. And let people decide as long as it is within a, a general rubric of inshallah yani positive uh, Islamic uh, uh, sense and ideology and theology let people decide which specific uh, area of that spectrum they feel the most uh, productive and the most useful and we need to be respectful of a wide variety of opinions right and then beyond that we need to tolerate if not respect 
And then beyond that, we need to grudgingly not really like and maybe gently warn against. And then even beyond that is where we throw in the card of heresy uh, or even uh, in extreme measures, try our best to eliminate those understandings. So mm -hmm. there is a spectrum and we begin with the spectrum, not just of tolerance, but of genuine bona fide respect. And again, you are, your, your podcast is generally a little bit more advanced. So let me be blunt in, in, in this conversation here. I am somebody who genuinely respects mainstream tasawwuf, mainstream wise Salafism, mainstream jamaat e islami uh, Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, this is these are spectrums. Deobandism, you know, the Azhari scholars. It's not a matter of grudgingly tolerate. I genuinely believe that this mainstream spectrum are insha'Allah ta'ala all upon good and taqwa and iman and khayr and that they have within them enough of a salvational uh, element of Islam that will allow them not only to enter Jannah but insha'Allah ta'ala they can aspire for Jannah to firdaus Now, look at the difference between an apolitical tablighi and between a jamati or a Muslim brotherhood. You know, baynahumma mafawas as the Arabic expression goes, between the two is an entire gulf and yet the both of them have their interpretation of the faith that inshallah ta'ala there is good in this so this is the spectrum that i actually think it's not just tolerating genuine respect we move beyond this and you're like well i don't respect those but khair, it is what it is and again i mean for the sake of the conversation let me be honest here you know some of the more you know um uh, hardline you know salafis the madkhali salafis for example and frankly i'm being honest here some of the unwise Hizb al-Tahrir type, the ones that really just don't, they, they're not willing to tolerate other opinions. And this is where I think my personal level of not really respect comes when you problematize the rest of the ummah, right? Mm -hmm. When you make them your enemies theologically or your your anger is primarily directed towards the internal of the ummah, frankly, you've lost my respect. Now, when that anger becomes takfiri, when that anger becomes violent, well then I'm sorry, that's not even tolerating anymore. Now we need to warn against you. Now we need to say you are not really worthy to preach your views. And especially when they become violent, well then, we can't just sit back and let people to be killed, you know, because of these radical understandings. So we have this entire spectrum. And now going back to your question here, do I have answers? I mean, not definitively, no, but I'm trying. And I also know my forte, my talents, and I also know my my experiences have shaped my worldviews. By the way, FYI, um, I was born into a Jamaat Islami family. My father was one of the uh, rukun of the Ikna, and you know, we, we I grew up in that. M the first Islamic book I read was Modudi. You know, the Modudi's writings. You know, they're the ones that shaped me, yeah. Yeah. and I became more apolitical when I decided to become mainstream Salafi in the early '90s. If you remember that phase here, you know, that took over, and then in the course of the last 15 20 years i've found my own voice my own niche in all of this so we are all products of multiple facets of existence our childhood shape us our experiences shape us we should be broad-minded enough to inshallah ta'ala appreciate a level of diversity but to answer your question who can arrogate arrogate to themselves i have achieved the solution who can have that level of of kibir to say this is the only way forward a'udhu billah on the contrary, I am trying, and I know you are trying, and I know many other people are trying to reach the haq, but it is only Allah that is al-haq, and we strive to be on the path to al-haq. Thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, can I just quickly follow up on that? Um, you sure. have expressed a number of, of political views and, uh, you know, you have the right, as you quite rightly said, everyone has a right to express their views and and to explain uh, their perspectives to, to Muslims. How important do you feel it is for you to seek advice from, or do you seek advice from, say, political scientists uh, when formulating a position, for example, on, you know, Muslim political participation or on the big themes or the grand themes of the caliphate, for example? So I am somebody who engages with a lot of people. I have a lot of people on my WhatsApp. Uh, I love to, uh, people who know me know this, uh, there's voice messages go back and forth on multiple uh, topics. And there are a group of people that I do uh, talk to my ideas and get their ideas from. A uh, few of them are more, far more experienced. I'm, I'm, my, my, my expertise is not political science. I've never claimed it is. So yes, mm -hmm. there are some people, but at the same time, 
uh, because I don't constantly talk about these issues, um, they're not something that I'm constantly engaged with. On the, but I am open to um, I am open to uh, conversations, and uh, there are a number of people who have taken it upon themselves to always uh, email me or or give me some updates about something they disagree with, and I appreciate that. I always appreciate sincere. Uh, constructive internal criticism, right? It's something that's very positive. So I encourage you and I encourage anybody that believes that, you know, they have the expertise to feel free to email me. My email is public. Feel free to give me constructive advice and, and give me worldviews that I'm not aware of. And inshallah, we're all uh, students of knowledge, inshallah, till the day that we die. Now, where do you stand on the fundamental question I raised in my introduction? Is Islam political? And if so, what does this mean? Define political, right? That's where the, I mean, okay, look, uh, let's be, let's cut the, the you know, the um, uh, polemics of what we all understand what you mean by political. We understand mm -hmm. in your worldview, you're, you're intending or you're wanting uh, to ask, should uh, Islamic laws be paramount in a society? And should a country or a region be ruled by the laws of Islam? Frankly, how can anybody uh, deny theoretically that that is uh, the, the, the default case, that is the ideal case. I think it is a very, very difficult, if not impossible, task to deny that Islam has elements that are clearly meant to be uh, implemented in society and that a society based upon the values of Islam is far more conducive for piety uh, and uh, for achievement of Allah's pleasure on this earth versus a society that, you know, the ones that we live in, where uh, it is a bit more difficult to, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So mm. theoretically, of course, I think everybody would say yes, but the, the devil is in the details as the, uh, as the saying goes. And in my humble you know, perspective, and again, this is an ongoing conversation, I always go back to this point. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. On the day of judgment, I will be asked about my immediate sphere of influence. What could I do given the circumstances I was born in, given the reality of the world that I live in, given my own talents and my, my resources to impact other people? And this is where I would say the beauty of Islam, the beauty of our religion really is demonstrated. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cater to uh, more scenarios than we can possibly imagine. And Allah will judge us based upon the scenarios we find ourselves in. Therefore, and again, I've always said this, for us Muslims living in Western democracies, in the liberal secular democracies we find ourselves in, we have to be crystal clear. We do not have the luxury, we don't have the uh, the Machiavellian reality of pretending to espouse one thing when we secretly espouse another. We don't believe this. What we preach is what we believe, and what we believe is what, is what we will preach. And I have been very public. It is not a part of the goals of our Sharia ah, that us who are living as minorities in Western lands, that we aim to overthrow the systems that we live under, and we aim to supplant uh, the, the, the systems, the government with uh, alternative versions. That is political suicide and it will be religious suicide for us. On the contrary, we aim to preserve our rights to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, we can aspire theoretically. We hope the world embraces Islam. We hope our lands embrace Islam and implement the Sharia ah of Allah. Yes, and I'll publicly say this. We hope this as a religious aspiration. But are we aiming? Are we strategizing? I mean, I think after the last 15 years, we understand almost all movements have toned down. And I mean, when I was growing up, by the way, that was not the case in the 80s. Um, uh, as you know, I grew up in the Jamaat background, the Muslim Brotherhood background and whatnot, and Hizb al were at their pinnacle, I would say, in the late 80s when I was a teenager. Um, the, the, the type of rhetoric we would hear in masjids would probably have you sent to Guantanamo in our times, right? Well, I can't repeat some of this stuff because it would get me into trouble to simply repeat what I used to hear in khutbas back in the 80s and early 90s. So we've matured. We had hmm. these naive, you know, idealistic slogans and we were punched in the gut post 9-11. And we were made to realize that we need to have very precise, clear goals while we're living here. So is Islam political by nature. And I know what you mean, so I'm not going to say, what do you mean by political? Theoretically, ideally, yes, it is. And for those who have the qualities 
and the circumstances to bring about effective change, good. But for us as Muslim minorities, our primary goal should be to preserve our faith, our theology, our rituals, our practice of Islam amongst ourselves and families and communities. And we do not explicitly aim, we do not politically strategize uh, to implement a different system, even though, we're going to get to this, I know, we try our best within the mechanisms of what is allowed to us, within the legal recourse that we have, to influence society in a positive manner. And again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Bottom line, you can't expect Muslim. I mean, let, let's be a bit more controversial. What do you expect Muslims in the, may Allah, may Allah protect all of them, the Uyghur concentration camp, the Uyghur, I'm not pronouncing correctly, but the, you know, the, the our brothers of East Turkmenistan. What do you expect them to do? Are you going to ask them, is Islam political? Should we establish a khilafah? Hmm. Is that within their purview to really be concerned about? Now, alhamdulillah, our situation in American England is far, far, far better. But again, is it something we will be asked about? What did you do in America? What did you do in Canada, in England, in Australia? We will make dua for our brothers and sisters in other lands to be more effective. And then, again, how, how deep do you want to go? What would you do right now? I don't want to mention specific countries because that might get me or you into trouble. But Middle Eastern tyrannical regimes, mm. dictatorships, even in Muslim-majority lands, how far can you go before the state apparatus is going to intervene and cut you into pieces, take you into jail, and you'll never see your kids again? Is that what Allah requires of us? Will we be held accountable for not standing up and, and, and challenging the tyrant uh, in, in that land uh, to establish a sharia according to our understanding? Or what if we work out a status quo where I can preach salah and I can have Muslims incentivize and make them come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then perhaps in a better circumstance, in a different time and place, we can push for other agendas. So boils down to question of priorities and question of pragmatic logistical capabilities, both of which the Sharia itself has taught us. The priority is tazkiyah to nafs, is closeness to Allah. It is to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, prepare for the final day. It is to worship Allah and to live an ethical life. That's what's going to get me into Jannah. If I have more luxury, more opportunity, then I continue to increase this fear. But if I don't, does that answer your question? No, it does answer my question. And, and it certainly, I agree that uh, we face a lot of challenges, uh, especially here in the West. And many of these challenges really impact who we are as a Muslim community and impact our very sense of being Muslim and our identity. And so there needs to be a focus on uh, these challenges that we face. But at the same time, uh, we do know that there is different expertise in the Muslim community. And certainly, you know, I live in a in a community where the majority of people have to really focus on these identity issues that you've discussed. But amongst us, you've got economists, you've got political theorists, you've got yeah. uh, Islamic scholars, you've got people who have got a greater understanding of Islamic philosophy and a greater understanding of the world around them. And, and I just wonder whether... We're missing something if we say that the focus of all of the Muslim communities in the West has to be on very immediate here and now. Um, I mean, it, it links to a discussion I remember you having. It was a really good discussion, actually. Um, it was a Qatira, I think, you, you held a year back on the five spheres of influence and change. Um, I mean, can you outline these five spheres that you talk about and maybe link it to the point I make about here in the West wherever we can move beyond maybe sphere one and two, which you which you, which you you talk about. Mm. Yes, okay, that was, yeah, you're right. The khatar I gave, uh, impromptu actually, was not prepared. Most of my khatras were just impromptu. Some of them are prepared. It was prepared. very good. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. So, um, because I was thinking about this issue for a while and then I just verbalized it in my mind and I just gave a khatar. So, um, I said that there's five spheres of influence we should all be thinking about. Number mm. one, global. You know, what's happening around the world and especially the hot spots for the Sleen and whatnot, you know. Number two, you know, in our own lands and countries that we find ourselves in and we have a certain political privilege. And so for me, it's America. Number three, the communities and the masajid that we're active in, you know, whichever local community you're involved in, you know, your, your, your immediate. And you can also even say your immediate society, like your, your district, your city, which is different than the national, right? Number four is 
your personal life, your family and friends, your actual people that you visit in their house and they come over to you and your family that you're related to. And then number five, you yourself personally, between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? These are the five spheres that every one of us, you know, can be thinking about. What I mentioned in the khatira is that many of us, we become so absorbed in the first and second and we don't realize that in reality we need to flip the script. And we need to start with number five and work our way back to number one, right? Rather than, because again, when you read the newspapers, newspapers are all about number one and number mm -hmm. two. Newspapers and, and media and what we, and most of us, what we're interested in are conversations. They're generally with the big stuff, right? The grand scale of things, what's happening here and there and whatnot. But in reality, going back to my previous point of a few minutes ago, Allah will ask me, how did I live my life? How ethical was I? How moral was I? How upright was I? How conscientious was I? What impact I had on my wife, my family, my children, my society, my immediate community. So bottom line, these are the five spheres of influence. Be aware of all five, but concentrate on number five and work your way out. And going back to Allah's um, taklif on us, Allah's putting on us obligations and responsibilities, it is in fact five and then four and then three and then two and then one. Even in the sharia, it's actually the other way around. So that was my point. Start backwards, even as, as you're aware of all five of them. Yeah. Um, often um, scholars are, maybe this is unfair, but scholars are described as being quietists. You know, people who use this sophistry of, you know, the five spheres, for example, or, you know, working on oneself. And, and that's an excuse to then not talk about the big issues of the day, to not talk about the Uyghurs, to not address the issues of France and to not address you know, the persecution against our ummah, but also to not address some of the really big political discussions that I think we have the luxury in the West to engage with. Um, isn't maybe a better way to view, and, and this is just, an, you know, as you were speaking, I was, I was contemplating this, a better way to view our taklif is to think of ourselves as a community and ask whether we're able as a community to address all five of these spheres in, an, in a competent and adequate way. And so if a community only cared about the Muslims in Palestine and forgot about oneself and one's community, that would be a failing community. But if we had the talents in one community, as you guys have in, you know, in Texas, you've got, alhamdulillah, a very good capacity, then maybe it's, it's worth having groups and communities and sub-communities that work on each and every single one of these uh, without excluding any one of them. Does that make sense? So, but the, I, 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 what you just said is basically a different way of saying what I said. Correct. That you start with number five. Hmm. That is fard ayn. But a lot of people are falling short of fard ayn. Right. Dare I say the bulk of the ummah is falling yeah. short of their fard ayn. So if they're struggling with fard ayn, you know, let's again be real. How many Muslims actually pray five times a day? How many Muslims actually sincerely are living their lives preparing for the day of judgment? Thinking about hisab, you know? How many Muslims are monitoring their income and making sure they eat ethical and, and halal and moral and whatnot? Hmm. You know the presenter roughly as well as I do. That's not a majority, right? Yeah. So my, my, my point that I've continuously been trying to say if Allah has blessed me with a pulpit, if Allah has blessed me with an audience of tens of thousands of people, every khutbah I gave when it goes online, tens of thousands of people, and I know that the bulk of them are failing in their minimal obligations. The bulk of them are not living ethical lives. The bulk of them are falling short in their relationships with their spouses, in, in, in not being you know, as good parents as they can be. Don't you think that it is more appropriate for me to emphasize that which they need and that which will save them and that which will benefit them immediately rather than to emphasize that which yeah, it's interesting to hear but it's not going to impact them so in my humble opinion and um, astaghfirullah may Allah I'm not trying to brag or boast but I would say out of all of the uh, 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 many of the, the people preaching my lectures are far more political than the vast majority of those that have the types of audiences I do Right, yeah. with what I'm not saying, I'm saying, I may Allah give me humility. I'm not trying to brag or boast, but look at how often I mention the Uyghur issue. The Palestine mm -hmm. is a constant motif for me. You know, I, I take trips there and whatnot, but still, the emphasis should be where 80 90 percent of my talks should be about something that will impact my audience at the immediate level. 
Now, if I were to give every single khutbah about Palestine, will it change the situation? <laughs> I'm here in Texas. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of pragmatics and being uh, reasonable. Having said that, again, to go back to your, to your question, and we'll you know move on to the next one after this, mm -hmm. those whose talents are separate than what I'm, I'm a preacher, I'm preaching to the masses, you know, mm -hmm. I'm a person who's trained in the Sharia, I'm supposed to inspire them, you know, to be better in their daily lives. But there are those that are inclined to think politically, those mm -hmm. that have the expertise or the influence very different than me. Well, then let them concentrate on the other spheres and let them, you know, produce material and impact where Allah Azza wa has given them the talents to do so. I think so that's a fair, not... yeah, reasonable I mean, that... position. I think that's a really good uh, bit of clarification. So you wouldn't be against, you know, in your community, I don't know, a group of uh, young, talented uh, postgrads who come together and say, look, we would like to, uh, we would like to engage with some of the big political issues, notwithstanding everything that you've said, of and course. we would like to, you would be happy with that. Yeah. I'm not just happy. I would, um, but this is happening, of course. I mean, I am. I am not directly involved, but I'm aware of people that are involved at the local level, at the national level. Right. And, you know, some of them approach me for questions and whatnot. And I encourage, you know, and what they're doing, uh, whatever I can, you know, encourage them within the, the mainstream views of yes. Islam. I'm very happy at this. Yes, it needs to be done. Great. Well, let me move on. Let me ask you about the vexed issue of political participation in the West. Now, I heard a recording of a meeting at your masjid where you invited a local Muslim politician. I think it was a Democratic politician. Uh, as well as your comments prior to a lecture you gave here in the UK at uh, the East London Mosque. And uh, you spoke of the success of Muslims in the UK to achieve high office. Now, maybe some could misconstrue that as you're praising these initiatives w in an absolute way, without constraints. Uh, are these approaches or are these initiatives where Muslims get involved with local politics always positive? This is a, a very multifaceted question. Let me let me attempt to um, explain it in a little bit more uh, detail. And I can see why some people um, who want rather simplistic 10, 15 second you know, clips, they, they have a, a very uh, superficial understanding of what I'm trying to say. Some people mm -hmm. think I'm sending mixed signals. No, I've actually been, I think, quite clear uh, in my positions, if you listen to my lectures, and by the way, the, I think you're talking about a local politician that I invited. If, if it's not, if it's the same one, uh, this was a city councilman, and I say yeah. this because uh, I, I don't know if you're aware in England, but here in America we have different tiers of, of office. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you do the same. A city councilman, I mean, frankly, there there's hardly anything they can do that is kufr or shirk. I mean, within that office, it's just a very uh, a very regional thing about you know zoning laws or you know hel helping the masjid at a community level. I mean, city councilman does not get involved in national policies, much less international policies. Uh, mm -hmm. And I did invite somebody like that to to actually have a very awkward conversation. I, I encourage viewers to listen to where I asked him point blank, "What do you do about issues that are unethical in office?" You know, at that small level, we're not talking yeah. about invading Iraq. There's no, they don't do that at that at that um, level. So yeah. it's not an endorsement. It was actually a a very frank conversation. Hey, look, let's see how we can understand. This is a person who studied Islam to a certain level, madrasa, you know, and uh, I think Hafiz Quran at least memorized some Jews, and now he's in, you know, politics at a very low level. So I actually mm -hmm. wanted to uh, interview him. That wasn't an endorsement. It was just an interview. And I, I encourage mm -hmm. everybody to listen to it. But um, here is where we get to the, the, the big elephant in the room. To what level should Muslims get involved in the politics of their lands? Mm -hmm. Let me preface by saying, Nobody has a clear-cut mathematical formula to apply in every single situation. This is a very gray area. It's a very dangerous area. It is an area where ongoing conversations are necessary, open dialogue with different segments of the community. And uh, may I simply say, inshallah, I hope that uh, all of us are mature enough to uh, going back to my first point, agree to disagree within the mainstream of Islam. It is dangerous to problematize and to make a fellow Muslim an enemy because of this gray area mm. uh, disagreement mm. here. My own position, and I've said this very bluntly, and that's my lifestyle approves this. I don't believe involvement in politics is the primary mechanism to achieve long-term positive change. Mm. I don't believe this. If I were, if I believed it, I would have been involved in that. 
I don't believe Siasa is within the Western land, and maybe even within the majority of you know dictatorships that are even in Muslim lands. I don't believe that is the most uh, fruitful, ethical, and spiritually fulfilling way to live one's life. And the path I have chosen demonstrates this. At the same time, it is a necessary evil. People have to live in lands that are run in the mechanisms they're run by. And at some level, after 9-11, we all realize this. We do need to influence our politicians, right? Pre-9-11, and I was one of them, I was extremely apolitical. Pre-9-11, I was mainstream Salafi, by the way, right? Albani type, or, you know, type, very mainstream Salafi, very apolitical. It, 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 the experiences of 9-11, of, of being in America, where our entire government is shutting down religious institutions, closing seminaries, right? And then within five years, 22 states are wanting to ban the Sharia. I don't know if you remember that time frame, but 22, that's almost half of our states, including where I was living at the time, there were attempts to legislate banning the Sharia, literally banning the Sharia. You can't just sit back and allow your own governments to, to, to take away your rights. You have to fight within the mechanism of the law. So we learned this the hard way after 9-11 that we can't just sit back and let them you know, do this to us. Realistic, and by the way, by the way, theoretically, here's the irony of ironies. Every mainstream strand of Islam, you know, from the Obandis to, of course, Jamaat and Muslim Brother and HT, and even Salafis. I mean, when I was uh, there in the 90s, you know, I would know the fatwas of Bin Baz and the Hayat Kibar al Ulama, and, you know, all of my teachers, yes, you should get involved and make sure you have your rights. And I would disdain, like, yeah, they don't know American politics. Our own teachers would tell us, even mainstream Salafis, look at the fatwa of the Hayat Kibar al Ulama. The Muslims living in minorities should try their best to influence the policies that will be more conducive to them, right? The irony of ironies, when we were the youngsters at the time, we would dismiss them, oh, you don't know the realities, and maybe they didn't know the realities. But theoretically, Almost every strand of Islam does say you can't just sit back and let them, you know, pillage and plunder your rights. You have to get involved to influence the system. But of course, the devil is in the detail. So l let's have a, a quick imaginary conversation between a more purist, you know, a puritanical person who doesn't want to get involved versus a, 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 a pragmatist politician. The purist is going to say Islam says we should not seek political power, right? The pragmatist is going to say, well, Yusuf السلام, sought it in a, in a regime that was kufri, and, and he did a good job. Yeah. The purist is going to respond, ah, but politics is corruptive, conducive to the soul. It, 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 um, it, it, it makes you less يعني, pious and whatnot. The pragmatist says, somebody has to do it. It's better that religious folks, people with a partial iman and taqwa do it, rather than those who don't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The purist responds, They shall never be pleased with you until you adopt their ways. The pragmatist responds, It's not about adopting their ways. It's about protecting our rights and being represented. The purist responds, You're going to have to compromise on some of your values. The pragmatist says, yeah, maybe, but there's a greater good that needs to be achieved. We choose our battles wisely. And we, we might not win every single battle, but if we win the larger battles, even if it comes at a loss, well then, it needs to be done. The purist says, the ends don't justify the means. The pragmatist says, there is no alternative to secure our rights. The purist says, you're never going to achieve all your goals. The pragmatist says, ah, but we have and we will achieve partial goals. So you can have this conversation back and forth. And in fact, you can even subdivide. There's an entire spectrum here as well. Mm. I say, so in my view, in my understanding, I would say you have the radical purists. They don't want the pragmatist to exist. They actively oppose them, maybe even takfir or tabdir. Mm. This is like the radical purists. You keep on going down, you get to the soft purists. They don't want to get involved themselves, but they understand somebody's got to clean the gutters. They understand somebody's got to, you know, clean the sewer systems and khalas, if some people are doing it, you know, that are better for us than others, well then let it be. They're not going to oppose the pragmatists, even though they're not going to get involved themselves. You keep on going down the spectrum, you get to what I call soft pragmatists, right? Soft pragmatists are sympathetic to uh, uh, the, the concerns of the purists, but they do believe it's the lesser of two evils. And 
They might not even believe fully in the system, but they need to take advantage of it to protect the rights of the Muslim community. Then you have the radical pragmatists, those that are basically complete believers in the system. And generally speaking, you don't find them to be of the practicing Muslims. And of course, this is a very loose um, spectrum here. My personal association, probably, if this spectrum were to be valid in your eyes, would mm. probably be in the soft purist side. Mm. I don't get involved. I don't want to get involved. I don't like getting involved. But somebody has to do it. And if I can find the soft pragmatists, right? If I can, if I can look at people who, they're still believers in Allah. They ha they they they're conscious. They have to answer for to a higher power. They're trying their best to navigate. I appreciate, perhaps at some level, what they're doing. Even though I personally would never endorse or like it, but it is the lesser of two evils. So, bottom line, to conclude this question, I know it's a long a long answer, but hmm. I am worried about myself, I'm speaking, to become so idealistic that we cut ourselves off from society and that we become basically people living in our own imaginary ivory towers to the point of neglecting, compromising really, being efficient in broader society. And I, I, I seek Allah's refuge from sounding patronizing, but what I'm seeing personally, a cycle going back to some of the puritanical views of the 90s amongst our youth who didn't live through the political turmoil of post 9-11 England and America. If you didn't live through that turmoil, if you didn't have a genuine sense of like anxiety, what is happening to the country I lived in? What is happening to the freedoms I took for granted, you know, in the 80s and 90s? What is happening to our communities? If you didn't live through that and you came to age five, 10 years ago, you're in your late 20s, early 30s, for example, and you didn't quite understand post 9-11, it is easier to revert to this naive... <sighs> Naive is a loaded term. I apologize for using that because in politics, everybody calls everybody naive. It's the one area you can have the most experience. doesn't matter. Everybody's a self-professed expert and everybody calls their opponents politically naive. It is the reality of the world. So I take that, that term back. Idealistic is better. Utopic is fine. I don't mind. To, to, to live in this ivory tower bubble of wanting 100% purity as if you're in a, a laboratory, the world is not like that. And I'm worried of reverting back to that stage of the 90s where we had the luxury to live like that without the impending doom of a post-9-11 world. We can't afford that over again. So we do need soft purists and soft pragmatists to have cooperation together to a reasonable level. Concluding with this maxim to this question, there's a maxim in fiqh, مَا لَا يُدْرَكُ كُلُّهُ لَا يُدْرَكُ كُلُّهُ what you can't acquire in totality, you don't leave in totality. Suppose we cannot acquire a fully Islamic system, surely we should try to acquire whatever we can that allows us to be Muslim. Wallahu alam. Now, I want to uh, address that, um, and and certainly I think you know your spectrum is a very good delineation of of where Muslims stand on the topic. And I think that's a really helpful uh, analysis. Um, isn't there a, a, a valid discussion? And I, I, I don't think this comes necessarily from the purists who look at the theological debates and argue that it's haram to participate. But there's a very, very valid political science discussion about the nature of the liberal state. Surely there are the engagement one has at a very high level. Fine, you're right. At a local level, maybe the concessions Muslims need to make uh, are going to be minor if, if insignificant. But the higher you go up the ladder, the more concessions you're going to have to make because the liberal okay. state requires those people from all minority communities, and in particular, as you said, after 9-11, it requires Muslims to make some very deep concessions about their faith or at least to acquiesce about uh, the, uh, the, sort of the type of society they wish to create. Um, as you know... Um, you know, in America, you, you see this. There are many Muslims who live in democratic states in particular who have been offended by some of the progressive social liberalism that has impacted themselves and in particular their children in schools. And um, it is clear that those Muslims who have joined a political system at a very high level, at a congressional level, and in the UK at a parliamentarian level, 
at, at the mayoral level even here in the UK, they've had to make some very deep concessions, uh, some very basic, very, you know, these aren't sort of um, superficial concessions, as you know. These are very deep concessions with the liberal state. So how do you uh, to observe, uh, the point I make there, how do you analyze, you know, just the, the strength of the liberal state in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, enforcing Muslims to to give something up. What are the red lines? I suppose is what I'm asking. The red lines, as a, as a person, inshallah, of ilm and of of knowledge. That's why I'm not involved in politics. Hmm. The red lines are going to be crossed at some level. Now, actually, let me let me again take a step back here. At some level, every one of us has to cross some red lines or make some concessions. I mean, if you work in corporate America, your corporation, by and large, must be involved in some ribawi transactions or something of a nature. Or if you, again, you're going to have to be involved in uh, uh, events that might have alcohol. And ideally, you shouldn't be in that room. Ideally, your, your, your level of iman and taqwa should not, you know, cause you to be there but sometimes that happens and the higher up you go even in court let's forget politics even in corporate life mm. the higher up you go the more concessions you're going to have to make the other day you know i'm a community leader in my in my masjid in epic the other day uh, somebody came up to me i didn't actually know this turns out mashallah he's very very blessed and wealthy and he has a corporation with 3,000 employees, like this is a multi-multi-millionaire, maybe even billionaire, I don't know, but he came up to me, mashallah, simple, see this other guy, I had no idea, and telling me, now the issue comes, the government is requiring him, Taban, with all of the laws and everything, to offer the same health packages to same sex as mm. to married couples, mm. right? He can't get out of it. What am I going to tell him? I can't say it's halal, it's not, but am I going to tell him to give up his corporation. He has a halal business. He's doing amazing work. One of the main, mashallah, good man, praise Fajr. Yani, inshallah, Allah has blessed him to have his own corporation. Allah has blessed him to be a mover and shaker in the community and whatnot. Do you understand what I'm trying to say is that at yeah. every, what if a, a purist from another land comes and says, you living in England, your tax dollars helped invade Iraq. How will you answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And from his worldview, he's got an element of truth right he's got an ounce of truth like i do feel bad but i know living in that world where he's living i'd have to compromise in other ways which he's not seeing let's not i don't want to go to do a tit for tat but the fact of the matter is even he has to compromise in some ways that he's not seeing here bottom line here let me let me answer your question a little bit more so my expertise is islamic aqid and theology right and i think what you're trying to say is issuing statements of kufr making problematic statements that go against the religion what do we do in this case right yeah. there's no and, doubt this... and, and no if i may say and normalizing haram yeah normalizing haram yeah and this is exactly why it is such a i would never want to be involved in politics and i would and as i've said this publicly anybody who's prioritizing standing in front of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how can you how can you get involved in an area where you're going to have to utter statements of kufr. I would never encourage anybody who genuinely fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to get to that level. It's never worth it to compromise your deen mm. for the sake of a dunyawi maslaha. Never, never. Yes, if you're forced, as Allah says, no, illa man ukriha. Okay, we're not talking about that, right? But the question, which again, so uh, first disclaimer, I'm speaking theoretically. Uh, Please don't read in about specific people or incidents because uh, I don't want to talk about specific sure. people or specific things. And, you know, I think one of the problems of the online da'wah scene is the constant refutation culture and naming and shaming. No, I don't believe this. Let's yeah. let's speak theory. Let's speak ideal and no, no reason to bring up specifics. I'm speaking theoretically. I have said very clearly it is wrong to utter statements of kufr. It is uh, not justified. The ends do not justify the means. I would never advise anybody, and if they were to come to me, I would say this is haram. Uh, it is not allowed. But what if we find a politician has done it? Yeah. What do we do when a politician has done this? Do we make takfir automatically of somebody? 
or not. Here is where I think, and this is my area of expertise, Aqidah, that's my PhD, my master's, my whole 15 years of study is in Aqidah. Here's where I politely point out, people need to study usul of takfir. People need to study when a person becomes a kafir versus when an act of kufr has been done. Mm. And it's much easier to say this is a statement of kufr or an act of kufr. And it is much more difficult and the bar is much higher than uh, to say this person has become a kafir. Well, firstly, purely academic. Become a kafir according to which aqidah, which theology? If you follow the theology of one strand of Islam, again, because we're advanced students, inshallah, may be blunt here, uh, Ibn Abdul Wahhab. If you follow that strand, okay, maybe the bar is lower and maybe it's easier to say kafir. But if you're following Deobandism, Ash'arism, if you're following, if you're a graduate of an Azhar University, if you're following statistically what is the bulk of the modern ummah, which is uh, Maturidis or, 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 or Ash'aris, actually, you couldn't make takfir because of a statement. You couldn't. You couldn't make takfir because of a statement or an action. According to their aqidah, which is the bulk of the ummah, you would have to verify, was he actually intending to reject Allah and his messenger through this statement? Hmm. So, this is a bit of an academic discussion, but inshallah there will be some benefit. The followers of Ibn Abdul Wahhab would say, if you make or do a statement of kufr for the dunya, you, be, you become a kafir. Now, pause here, footnote. Modern Salafi practitioners of the kingdom, there's a bit of a spectrum when Udhur Bijahil comes in and when excuses come in. And you can make the case that modern Salafis have a small spectrum between them. And my mm. teachers, I know this because I study there, mm. my teachers, some of them might have found a way out for this person. Say, we don't make takfir immediately. But I'm, I'm, I'll be honest and say, traditional Ibn Abdul Wahhab theology would immediately make takfir of somebody who wasn't forced by gun to utter a statement of kufr for the dunya. Okay, simple. Uh, even though I say modern Salafis have different views within them. However, that's only one strand of Islam. Ash'arism, Maturidism, the, 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 the bulk of the ummah would say, and again, I'll be explicit because we're talking about this. If a politician utters words of kufr, for the sake of the dunya, he wants money, the status, position. This, These are words of kufr. And we say these are words of kufr. But if you verify that he said it for the sake of the dunya, according to their theology, and again, I'm not saying which one's right or wrong, I'm mm. just simply telling you factually, right? Mm. This removes from him the verdict of kufr. Now, they have evidences. By the way, very interesting evidence. I gave a whole khatir about this. The incident of Hatib ibn Abi Balta in the seerah, right? Where he betrayed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in order to protect his family, hmm. right? And Imam al-Shafi'i explicitly used this to avert takfir, you know? And he goes, he didn't become a kafir even though he betrayed Allah and his messenger because he loved his, he wanted to protect, uh, you can, I don't want to go to the Sirah, but you can listen to my lecture there. Yeah. He did something that would have been considered kufr, but he did it for a dunya we benefit. He wanted to protect his wife and children, right? And the Prophet ﷺ, and he excused, the, he didn't justify, but he lifted the verdict of kufr, right? And in fact, in Hatib's case, he forgave him because of Hatib's uh, past here. So when you say, Committing acts of uh, becoming a kafir, I have to ask you according to whose aqidah. If the person says, Okay, uh, I am a follower of Ibn Abdul Wahhab, and according to my understanding, it's takfir. Okay, khair, I, I admit it is takfir, but give the rights of other groups, give the rights of other theologies, which are frankly mainstream Sunnism, right, to disagree. The second point, even if it is uh, kufr or takfir, what is the protocol or mechanism that is the wisest to follow? That's a question we should have a discussion about. Who should be the one and how should this be? And especially when we're in a public setting where Muslims and non-Muslims, where already the Islamic identity of uh, the person is being used negatively, right? Again, let me be, I, I gave a, a lecture in my own country. We have Muslim politicians that are doing kufri things. I have no problem saying they're doing kufri things. I have no problem saying some of the statements and actions are blatant kufr. Mm. 
in conjunction with the senior clergy of this country, I have spoken to them, and you know who they are. I've mentioned them by name multiple times. People that are older than me, wiser than me. We have decided that we will call out her and his, whatever it might be, wrong actions by the actions, but we're not going to excommunicate. We're not going to collectively, uh, um, uh, publicly throw her under the bus because these politicians in the eyes of the masses represent Islam, the non-Muslim masses. And it doesn't make sense for us to internally excommunicate even as we try to work to better their understandings of Islam. So this is a... You, you now, by the way, to be very clear, people have the right to disagree with this analysis. People have the right to say, you should. Good for them. What they don't have the right to do is to then lump those of us who choose to not excommunicate to be tacit endorsements of the kufr. Do you understand what I'm saying here, right? Yeah. Just because we don't excommunicate doesn't mean we're endorsing the kufr. So the first question, theoretically, when does kufr become, a, uh, when does a person who commits kufr become a kafir? You have to go and study Islam and have an understanding and know there's a spectrum. The second, even if that is the case, upon whose tongue should this be done? And that's where we talk about, and I have to say one thing. One of the things I like about the Deobandis, and I, I love all these mainstream groups, even though I'm not one of them, and I have my polite disagreements with the Deobandis. One of the things I like about the Deobandi movement, they really do have a respect for their seniors in terms of, of clergy. Mm -hmm. They do have a, a kabir mentality, right? That until the akabir do it. And I, I know that has negatives, but I think overall, in my humble opinion, uh, the positives outweigh the negatives. And as somebody who was a Salafi and still is very soft-hearted. I, I know people don't believe this, but I'm still very soft-hearted towards Salafism. Um, I think I miss this aspect of the Ubandism in our movement, in our in my ex-movement. That one of the things is, you know, a lot of Salafism, what, what it wanted to do was that it gave you the, the maybe even cockiness in some level, right? Mm. Uh, to just, what's the dalil? I don't care if, if Bin Ba said it, he doesn't have the dalil. I will hear this in Medina, by the way. I don't care if Fulan said it. He's a, a student and undergraduate, you know what I'm saying? I don't care if the head kebab said it. They don't have the dalil to say it, you know? Now, at some level, you appreciate to that level of, I'm not going to be a blind follower, but let's be honest here. You kind of sort of opened up that Pandora's box, right? Of everybody having that, that sense. So, who does it? How it's done? And even if, by the way, even if you think a person is a kafir, is it politically wise to make um, this public when this person represents Islam in the eyes of many people? That's yeah. another question altogether. But can you, can you see I, what I'm saying here? Yeah, no, I, I, I certainly see that. And I, I think, you know, by and large, Muslims uh, recognize that. What do you say about the about being careful about um, pronouncing takfir left, right, and center, especially with with public personalities. But then I do fear, and it's back to this point of legitimizing and, and popularizing haram, I do fear that the actions of many Muslim politicians, if left, if left not, if we don't criticize those actions, then many people, especially young people, and I teach a number of young Muslims mm -hmm. who... Uh, who do get caught up in this political cycle and they end up in a very different place. They may be brought up in very good Muslim families, but at one year, two years, three years campaigning for this left-leaning party or even this right-leaning party, uh, within time, their sensitivities, their morality, their ethics change, and uh, it just becomes acceptable to, to normalize mm -hmm. haram. In Excellent. the case of in the case of your, you know, your um, uh, congregant who's a, you know, a millionaire, or, you know, he's got his, he's got his firm. He's he knows what is haram. He's not publicly expressing that haram. He recognizes that there is a failing here, and he's got to try to navigate around it. And alhamdulillah, you know, he's he's got taqwa in that sense. He he fears mm -hmm. Allah subhanahu wa taala, and that's why he's asking the question. But we've got here young Muslims who brazenly now and openly support. And recognize and accept what is unacceptable in in the deen. And, and you're absolutely right. I, I I'm I'm. There's nothing to say about this. Unbelievably, for the first time in Islamic history, 
this notion of fahisha and the LGBTQ understanding is now becoming something that some young Muslims believe, oh, there's two opinions about this. Hmm. And I, I agree with you. One of the causes for this is the modern world we live in. And therefore, we do need to be very blunt and clear. And, and again, not to toot my own horn, but listen to any prepared lecture I've given. Hmm. I've given 10 lectures on this topic and hmm. khutbahs, and I keep on talking about them. No, I've heard of them, yeah. But the issue comes, firstly, firstly, let's be careful, let's be cognizant of the psychological bias of finding a soft target and using that soft target to express our legitimate grievances and anger, mm -hmm. which is what I'm seeing a lot of the Muslim community do, right? These Muslim politicians, sad, wallahi sad. I have nothing to say. They failed in these regards. But they are not the primary culprits that you should be angry about. They are the products of the culprits. Good. So we have to go beyond and take our anger to the root cause, number one. Number two, you're right. We have to try to stemmy this tidal wave of fahisha. But we also have to be cognizant of the other psychological bias of raddat al-fi'l, of, you know, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. We saw what happens when the doors of takfir are opened up. So yes, we have to speak out against normalization of fahisha, but we cannot open up the door that is also the door of extremism, which is takfir by everybody, takfir by the masses, everybody else. We don't want that either. So let's try to find a nuanced balance where we can preach against the fahisha, we can criticize those Muslims who say wrong things, and we can also teach our masses to not make blanket takfir surely mm. and, and here's where again when you try to be nuanced both sides get frustrated at you and you become the target because the simpletons want sound bites the the purists on both sides right the radicals on both sides don't want to engage in a pragmatic conversation whether you and i like it or not we have Muslim politicians right now in office in American England that are blatantly saying statements of kufr. Khalas, I've said it. They're, they're saying kufr. Now, what do I do with them in office? That is a separate conversation. They're staying, st st doing things of kufr. I've said it. Okay, no problem. No, we've said it. Now, should we, as a community, boycott, tacitly support, directly support? Let me be blunt here. This entire spectrum, it is within the spectrum of theological permissibility now. Do you understand this point here? Mm -hmm. Whichever side you choose, it's not the same as endorsing the kufr. Now, those that want to engage say, you're, you're right, he's committed kufr. You're right, this is wrong. Uh, what he's done is wrong. But I need to now engage with him to at least do something positive. He's failed in one area. Why should we let him fail in other areas? That's the pragmatist, right? Then you have the pure, and you get the spectrum again. So we have to raise the level of discourse, and this is what I've been trying to do. I, I, I would like to say, if anybody listens to my full lectures, they're going to hear the same sentiment over and over again. You're not going to find that quick sound bite, unless I slipped up, in which I'm siding with the, the radicals. What I'm saying, my heart is with the purists. Hmm. My methodology is with the purists. My life is with the purists. But what do I do right now with the elected officials that are doing some positives for the ummah. And they are doing some positives for the ummah. And I'm saying, you have a spectrum of permissibility. Those that want to engage with them, I see what you're doing. And yani, as long as you are not supporting the specific evil, as long as you ally for another good cause, okay, I see what you're doing and I can't say anything that's wrong there. And those that are irritated and want to boycott, I see what you're doing as well. Within this spectrum, um, Let's move on to politics of a different kind. Uh, what do you think about the project to revive the caliphate? Um, I watched the discussion you had with Imam Tom and Uthman Badr, and it was a very good discussion. What is your position on the obligation to have a caliphate as an ummah? So, um, like I said, I, I, I think it is a fard kifaya. Um, I, I think it is obvious that it is a fard kifaya. 
But as I said in that uh, interview, and I do as, as of yet stand by this, and hey, listen, we're all students of knowledge. Continue to dialogue with me. Continue to, to, to show me whatever evidences or views that you have. But my own reading of the Quran and Sunnah, my training in Islamic studies, my understanding of the seerah, and my life experiences all put together. And hey, I could change. I don't know the future. But at this stage of my life, I'm very comfortable saying it is a farud kifaya, one out of many, 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 many other furud kifayat. And given the circumstances I myself am in and the world that I find myself in, mm. it is relatively low on my list of farud kifaya priorities. Those that are doing, now for me, maybe you have a PhD in political science and maybe you have a think tank and maybe you, for you, it might be a higher level of farud kifaya. Mm. Even you might be living my neighbor. You yeah. might have the same yeah. circumstances, but your expertise and your knowledge and your talents make it a higher fard kifaya for you than it is for me, right? But overall, given the circumstances we find ourselves in, I don't think it is of the goals of the Sharia ah to constantly bring up this topic of khilafa and 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 uh, having a, a, a dawla islami and whatnot when the bulk of the ummah is struggling to live their lives as muslims and i do and i have to be a little bit honest here i do find it problematic when some segments of the ummah take other segments as enemies when they don't agree with their interpretation of siyasa of politics of the obligation of the khilafa i've said this bluntly you want to establish the khilafa i'm not stopping you go do it you know what i'm saying but for you to impede my da'wah to problematize me to say i'm a deviant or and and this happens all the time and i have to be it really irritates the heck out of me i'm raising funds for Palestine. i'm raising funds for syrian refugees and there are certain and I'm, these aren't juhal I can't mention names, but these are senior members of these various, you know, movements. And you know which movements I'm talking about. Mm. Senior members in the Western world, they will publicly post on uh, social media, sometimes in my own, you know, uh, uh, fundraising, uh, until we establish the Khilafah, all of these funds, you know, are just a waste of time. Mm. Yeah, honestly, this really irritates the heck out of me. Neither are you helping these refugees, these, I've been to these camps, I've seen the situation, right? If you, if Allah were to bless you to speak to them directly, are you going to say to them, "Oh, until you establish a khilafah, there's no point helping this child, you know, uh, who's starving to death"? Well, like this is where I worry their level of idealistic utopism, their level of yani, being disconnected from reality. They become impediments to khair and good. They're actively discouraging. Now, in your worldview, if you believe that the khilafah will eliminate poverty, pause your footnote, that is itself a falsehood and it shows a lack of education of, of their people and it shows they actually haven't studied history. And by the way, this incident of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz eliminating zakat and whatnot. Honestly, this is not true. Read history and if you want, we can discuss this. It's actually a misunderstanding. Go look at the... It's not even um, Thabit Isnadan. Uh, it's not even mentioned in a book of history. And even if it happened a one-off, having an Islamic land is not going to eliminate poverty. Mm. Uh, this is a very misunder big a misunderstanding. When you teach young men, you know, misunderstandings of, of, of realities of politics, misunderstandings of utopic ideals. Frankly, you open up the door to being sympathetic to radicalism. Uh, we had this crisis when, when ISIS was around. We had people who literally thought leaving their lands and going to that what is an establishing utopia on earth. How did they get to that stage of understanding? Because the versions of Islam they were taught were Frank, frankly, mythical fairy tales. They weren't taught real sharia. Ah. They weren't taught real history. And we find the same sentiment, maybe to, not to the level of radical jihad, we find the same sentiment among some of those who are arguing for this version of, of khilafah. Anyway, yeah, yeah. I know I'm being a little bit strict here, but it needs to be said. If no, you're not going to no. help the ummah at its weakest, mm. don't prevent others who are trying to help the ummah at its weakest. Simple no, as that. I, I think you're right. I mean, I think there is an immature way to call for the khilafah. And as you said, those people who exceptionalize it to a point where everything else becomes unimportant... Um, you know, and 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 they uh, p uh, they depict the khilafah to be the solution to each and every problem the ummah faces. I mean, this mm -hmm. is almost communistic, I think, in its in its you know in its overtones, right? It and let me like, ask you, brother Muhammad. Yeah. Let me ask you. Surely you know that is a fairly common sentiment in some movements. 
I, I think so. I think that's a common sentiment. And I think I'll, I put it down to, to no, yeah. no, no doubt about it. I, I put it down to sort of the, the 20th century Islamic movements who probably, and maybe this is an unfair thing to say, but they've probably failed in, in their objectives. And now are just sort of pursuing an agenda to shore up the base. And, and this is one of the ways in which you do that. But I, you know, t notwithstanding that, notwithstanding that immaturity, there are, as you said, you know, Khilafah is the Farda Kifaya. And, and my understanding, and, you know, I, I defer to your, uh, your, your greater Islamic knowledge, but my understanding of Kifaya is that, you know, there needs to be segments of the Muslim community who have the expertise and the ability who work towards achieving that in the same way in my community, if, for example, there's a, a good group of brothers who uh, look out for converts who pass away without a family mm -hmm. and they take it upon themselves to bury them and to collect funds and to bury them in a graveyard. Now, not I'm everyone in the Muslim community is doing that, but because they're doing it, the sin is lifted from our neck because they're practically engaging in, in that kifaya. I mean, I suppose what I'm asking is that you wouldn't be against those Muslims who have maturity, who've got expertise, who think deeply about this matter, who recognize, as you said, that there are multiple duties that the Ummah faces. But because of their expertise, they're going to concentrate on this task and try to popularize and build some support for this activity. Not only would I not be against it, I would love to listen in, participate. I would mm -hmm. love to see what I can do. Yeah. Um, no problem. Uh, like I said, my, my main pet peeve is when these movements take as their targets and spend any amount of time problematizing the rest yeah. of the practicing Muslim community. Yeah. That to me is where they've lost the plot completely. I am not just, I want people to do this. I want, but Everybody has an expertise and everybody has a passion. Everybody has, you know, uh, something that they're doing. So let those that are specialized in this field and those that have the talent and, and, and those that, frankly, and here's another awkward reality, uh, Brother Muhammad. It's really awkward to say this. It is the political luxuries that are afforded to us in the West True. that allow so many of us to have such grandiose visions and skills, the very systems that so many of us are opposed to at a fundamental level, allow us the luxury. We wouldn't be, many of us wouldn't be thinking and talking like this had we been born and raised under autocratic regimes in Muslim majority countries. Frankly, even if we wanted to, we wouldn't even have the luxuries to do so. This is why I don't want to open up that door, but as you're aware, yeah. some very prominent Western Muslim yeah. ulama and thinkers They've actually said it's better, given the current circumstances, that we just deal with status quo and live under these, you know, liberal secular regimes because it allows us to 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 be these righteous Muslims. Now, again, I don't agree with that, but as, as you're aware, I had an interview with some of the people like they, they literally said this and you're like, wow, OK, they, they don't even think we should try to revive the Khilaf. I mean, at least I'm saying it's Fard Kifai and some people should do it. There are people senior to me in age and in knowledge and inshallah, I mean, clearly in taqwa, no doubt about that, who actually think that the reality shows us that this is a project that is counterproductive and dangerous, and it is ironic. They also say this, because the people that are most championing it are products of systems that would never have allowed them to champion it had they been under the very... And again, I've had people say this you know, um, uh, to me and others when I just talk about Islamic politics. Well, then why don't you go live under the Taliban? Why don't you go live under those other places if, you've, if you feel such a way? And that's why I say I, I'm, I see the positives of living in uh, the lands that we live in, and I see the negatives as well. It's not a black and white world. No, I, I think I think you're right. I mean, to uh, to paraphrase something I heard from Uwayr Meir Anjum, who I know you you know quite well. Yes, good uh, friend of mine. He, yeah, yeah. He he argues that um, the very luxuries that we have in the West to speak freely and to think about some of these big philosophical political debates. Uh, those luxuries should be utilized by those Muslims who have expertise. And and again, I, I think he's very clear. It's not for everyone to do so. I mean, I, if I go to my local mosque, I can't imagine most of the people in that congregation to really contribute to or to, you know, to, to engage with the, the great philosophical debates about Khilafah because it's it's just beyond their capabilities to engage with that. But I exactly. suppose that's just the nature of yeah. the nature of the kifaya. Yeah. 
Great. I mean, I, I think I would add, um, I mean, I, I listen to and watch most of what you produce. And um, on a very regular basis, I do see a lot of uh, good material on Khilafah. Uh, in particular, I would like to point my viewers to the direction of your khutbah that you gave. I think it was uh, 99 years after the destruction of the Khilafah. And I, I think it was a really, really worthy but to listen to so jazakallah khair that's great well yeah come there. Um, like i said I, I i hope i am showing in my lectures and talks that i'm giving islamic politics in my humble opinion it's due hmm. not making it the end all and be all but at the same time definitely not neglecting and ignoring it now i know time is against us but i would like to ask you about uh, the ideas of some muslim modernists who say that Islam should be separated from any form of coercive power. Now, of course, we're not talking about ISIS here. We're talking about a state that uh, applies Islam in its proper manner. Now, they argue that when we historicize key events in Islam, we conclude that mm -hmm. it was just incidental maybe to the revelation that the Messenger وسلم, was a, a ruler, a government, a head of a government. Um, and this is not intrinsically part of the Islamic message. I mean, how do we uh, navigate or engage with such discussion? What's your view about that? Yeah, so, I mean, um, the first person to suggest this was the, obviously, the, I mean, you know, Ali Abdul Razik mm. uh, in the what, 1930s, 1920s, yeah. um, an Azhar graduate who, um, you know, was the first to say that we have misunderstood Islam it's supposed to be a spiritual faith, not a political one. And of course, he did this in the aftermath of the... So the Khilafa, the collapse of the Ottoman Khilafa, triggered an entire series of movements. Really interesting, right? And we're still riding the waves of those movements. And I'm somebody who says, enough of riding the waves, really. We're in different time and place, and we need to go back and rethink through. You know, we need to just anyway. So that's another pet peeve I have is that we're always going back to these thinkers of all all of the mainstream movements. By the mm -hmm. way, all mm -hmm. of them, they're going back to thinkers in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. You know, and they're saying, "Khalas, this is out." But I don't agree with this. But anyway, Ali Abdul Razik was the ex exact one extreme, mm -hmm. and of course, he was soundly refuted. Um, actually, he was stripped of his title. Right? Really interesting. One of the few cases in history yeah. where Azhar mm -hmm. said. Well, he graduated, but yeah, we don't agree he graduated, so we're going to take his title back. He's not an Azadi graduate, you know what I'm saying? Listen, I mean, I obviously strongly, strongly disagree. I, I mean, to the point of I have no problem saying that's a heretical opinion. It's clear that, you know, to, 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 it's clear that such individuals are trying to um, look at the world through Christian lenses. Christianity is unique in that uh, Judaism cannot do this and Islam cannot do this, right? Mm. Christianity was able to form something called secularism. You could have never formed a secular understanding of the world uh, unless you don't have law. Because Christianity in you know, the 3rd, 4th century eliminated the law, because mm. they started believing that you know if you believe in Jesus, there is no sharia basically, right? Mm. Um, because they don't have an entire system of detailed laws, they had the luxury when they needed to, when they started having civil wars about theology, because that's the only thing they were arguing about. When they had civil wars about the nature of Christ and whatnot, they said, you know what? Let's leave religion outside the room. Let's just deal with the modern world. And you couldn't have gotten to that understanding of, of, of uh, politics unless you believe in a faith that doesn't have laws in it. right? And therefore, what's happening now is that Certain Muslim thinkers are absorbing uh, the laws, uh, I mean, the understandings of secularism, and then trying to project it onto Islam. And of course, conceptually, that's not the first time Mu'tazila did it the same with Hellenistic thought. Conceptually, that's the way that the world works. You absorb certain ideas, then you back project them onto your own tradition. We need to be cognizant that that's not the way we do things, that's not the way I do things. That having been said, we also have to be cognizant, as I said, of counter reaction. Mm. of becoming too fundamentalist and fanatic. So while I strongly disagree with, with Ali Abdul Razik, I don't have answers to what I would do had I been in a Muslim-majority country. And I don't know I, that circumstance is beyond my control. Let's not mention specific countries, but let's say there's a country that there's certain freedoms allowed as a Muslim. You're not going to get jailed if you're trying to lobby for some Islamic laws. To what level should I lobby for Islamic laws when I know I'm never going to get to perfection? Can I compromise and get a 50% law rather than 100% or is that kufr? 
And I gave examples in public. So, for example, um, many countries, in fact, no country in the world these days um, uh, operates Islamic economic system. No country in the world, hardly any Muslim country, in fact, no Muslim country uh, implements jizya. Zero. Zero. Even though it's in the Quran. Um, the majority of countries allow, don't criminalize um, uh, consensual intercourse between uh, consenting adults, right? The majority of Muslim countries do not criminalize this, correct? You, you yeah. understand what I'm saying here? Yeah. Now, yeah. suppose I was a person of influence in that country. Suppose I was uh, lobbying for politics. Am I allowed to say, am I allowed to champion, hey, okay, you're not going to criminalize, I get it, but... If it happens outside of marriage, we'll find them, you know, a thousand dollars. Now, the purist is gonna say, La hawla wa la illa billah, in al hukmu illa lillah, you're a kafir. You know? And the pragmatist is gonna say, Yes, excellent. Something is better than nothing. Let's work our way to that system. Hmm. And you know what? I don't have an answer. I'm not tested with that. But I understand both sides of the view, and I can see now the the, the purist in me is cynical. But it's not theologically excommunicating. It's cynical. Why? Yeah, yeah. Because the last 75 years have shown us. What have they shown us? Liberals will tolerate everything except Islam. Look at, I don't want to mention countries' names, the most quote-unquote democratic country in the Arab world. They just really, uh, you know, um, uh, took into jail their Islamist leader. Mm. Without mm. mentioning names, those who know, know. Yeah. That Islamist leader, and frankly, here's the irony, on a personal level, I respect him on a one-on-one. -on -one. I've met him a few times. I respect him. Mm. But I told him last time I met him, Ya Sheikh, ila mata, how much are you going to compromise? I literally said this. Yeah. You know, how much are you going to compromise? This was a few years ago. And he kept on thinking, I'm going to compromise, I'm going to compromise. Was it worthwhile? Now, the pragmatist pushes back. And this is where I don't have an answer. Mm -hmm. And the pragmatist says, you, too, you, you are too short-termed. You're only looking at today. You're not thinking 30, 40, 50 years ahead. And what the pragmatist says is, I mean, let's look at, let's look at England. Let's look at America. Mm -hmm. 50 years ago, as far as I remember, you guys didn't even have one non-white MP. Exactly. If I'm not mistaken, the yeah. first non-white MP was in the 80s. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. 25 years ago, you didn't have a single Muslim MP. Not a single Muslim MP pre-9-11. Yeah. Okay. 10 years ago, the MPs that you have, if I'm not mistaken, they weren't very public about their Islam or practicing or fasting or whatnot. They were civilizationally Muslim. I'm not making takfir. I'm saying they didn't wear Islam on their sleeve, as I'm trying to say. Yeah. Right? Now we have a Muslim, as soon as he's elected, I'm fasting and I'm praying with my family. And he puts it on, you know, Twitter. Yeah. The pragmatist says, look, success doesn't come overnight. But I'm still a purist. I'm just not making takfir and tabdiyah of the pragmatist. Do you understand? And this yeah. frustrates my followers who are hardline purists. And this causes yeah. some of my critics to say he's justifying. So be very clear. Read my lips, as George Bush said 35 years ago. Yeah. Read my lips. I'm not justifying. Mm. I'm simply pointing out facts. This is not justifying. I'm still a purist at heart, and I don't endorse this. And the ends don't justify the means. But I keep on pointing out, those that get involved in the political side of things don't care what the ulama say. Mm. They have a different set of parameters they live by. I don't agree with it, but I have to deal with that reality in the world that I live in. I hope that's clear because yeah, that, that, that is clear. That is clear. I don't know. I mean, I think uh, maybe I'm speaking now in the context of the UK. Uh, many Muslims, especially young Muslims who uh, engage with politics, they are concerned. Well, many of them are concerned about uh, the Islamic position. And I suspect some of them, uh, they get into politics because there is a silence, and maybe I'm being unfair, but there is a silence in the, in the local uh, Muslim community about the parameters and the red lines, and there's a lack of criticism sometimes or pushback against those 
mayors and and first ministers who engage in as you said the the fahi show a so, lack of criticism and pushback i i don't know i'm seeing online there's <laughs> it's like opposite i don't know Am I, are we looking at two different scenarios <laughs> well of course i mean you know social media is a different world i mean i'm i'm thinking about uh pushback from uh islamic scholars right from you know mm. those who lead islamic seminaries rather than youtube personalities mm. um okay yeah. that's a valid i mean a valid point i mean I can't speak on behalf of the UK. Mm. I'm speaking on behalf of America. Mm. I don't interact directly with any Muslim congressman or congresswoman. I don't have any contact with them. I've never met them in office. Never. I don't do this. Mm. The people I interact with are on the more local level. And as I explained, local yeah, politics yeah, yeah. is yeah. very different than national politics, right? So... The reason why there's no explicit pushback from me, like I explained, I don't think it is wise at this stage to throw our Muslim politicians under the bus within our community publicly. Mm. I, I could be wrong, but even if I'm wrong, this is not an endorsement of their kufr, which is what the critics say. It's a siyasa move and a political move. You weigh the pros and cons and you could be wrong. Mm. I just, at this stage, it is better to warn against their evil and their mistaken beliefs, which I have done publicly mm. without mentioning them. Because again, I don't see the point. Everybody knows mm. what I'm talking about, right? Exactly. But I don't want my clip to be used by Fox News against somebody who represents Islam. Do you understand what I'm saying here, right? Yeah. I don't want to give ammunition to the enemies of the ummah because in the end of the day, she is recognized or he is recognized as being a part of the ummah by the enemies of the ummah. So I need to be wise in how we manage this, which... Some of the critics, they want their five minute or five seconds clip. The world is more nuanced than this. Yeah, and no. you can disagree. I understand this. But as of yet, people senior to me, older than me, wiser than me. I mean, I'll mention some names in the sense, forget this issue. The people I look up to when it comes to American uh, realities, Imam Siraj Wahaj, Imam Zaid Shakir, and others of their ilk, they're 20 years older than me. Mm. 20 years older than me. Yeah. I am nobody compared to them. If I were to criticize, wallahi, as Allah is my witness, I would first ask their advice before releasing anything publicly. And push them. Sheikh, you should do this. And if they refused, I would pray istikhara, say, should I really do this? Should I go? And I'm almost about to hit 50, by the way, right? Mm -hmm. I would not do such a dramatic... I'm just speaking for myself. Please don't read it by any... I'm just by myself. I would not do such a dramatic move that can be used by Fox News that's going to cause issues in my community, in the broader community, yeah. because I respect people older and wiser than me. And I would have gone to them if I felt, but I don't, because I don't feel that, you know publicly excommunicating this congresswoman is a benefit and I don't you know excommunicate her anyway I may, I, I do udr bil jahr or whatever it might be or I say if you're an ash'ari theologian which I'm not she wouldn't or he wouldn't even be you know potentially uh, um, uh, considered a kafir if they did it out of maslaha dunya you get my point you went over that yeah. that discussion before yeah. can I ask you I know uh, again time is, is against us but I've always wanted to ask you this question um, Dr. Yasser Khadi um you know you've got uh, detractors online, and some of them claim that your study in Western Academy has somewhat softened your orthodoxy. I mean, is this a fair criticism? <laughs> I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to always grant me ikhlas. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to see the truth as truth and to uh, follow it as the truth and to uh -huh. not fear the criticism of the critic. I mean... You know, the, I, it's funny you say this. Um, I remember the first time I heard this back in 2005 when I started realizing that back then there was a different da'wah scene and there was a lot of animosity between the Salafi movement and the mainstream Tasawwuf movement, Al Maghrib and Zitun and others, you know. Hmm. And as I'm becoming, and, and you know, I started right at the bottom of the ladder in terms of da'wah, maybe not at the bottom in 2005, but still, I wasn't a national figure in 2005. But slowly but surely, you know, the opportunities were handed to me and whatnot. And I began to realize it's not healthy that when I was still Salafi, that there's so much animosity between Salafis and, 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 and Sufis. In fact, that what prompted me, um, a catalyst, and this is public news and knowledge, a very prominent university in America, very well-known university, was about, its MSA, the ISOC, was about to split into two. One MSA, one ISOC would have been like Salafi inclined and one MSA would have been 
you know, Sufi inclined. Mm. And when I heard this, wallahi, it's like, what are we doing? Mm. What, what are we doing? And so I reached out and alhamdulillah, then it led to a series of conversations. We had to pl pledge a mutual respect. When that came out, you can Google it, find out. Oh, Yale has corrupted Yasir Qadhi. Hmm. Oh, he softened from the haq he used to be upon. And after that, every change or every opinion or everything, it's a simplistic ad hominem, right? Blame the education that you don't understand hmm. and you can contextualize and make yourself feel better why so-and-so has the position that he has. Look, in the end of the day, I am not asking for anybody, anybody to listen to me, much less to take me as some type of astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah intellectual leader, not at all. And if somebody is comfortable with the shuyukh that they have and they're mainstream, and I come along and you find me confusing, I am telling you, as the Prophet ﷺ said, leave that which is doubtful to that which is not doubtful. Mm. Stick to those whom your heart is inclined towards, and don't get involved with me or my shady opinions that you think or my weird views. No problem. I'm not asking anybody to rock their boat. Mainstream Sunnism, all of the movements are good. But beyond them is the bulk of the Ummah. Beyond them is 90% of unaffiliated. Hmm. And for those that find comfort in what I'm saying, for those that find sense in what I'm saying, I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make me worthy and to conceal my faults and sins that I know that I have. The, 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 the notion of blaming, oh, the kufar corrupted him. I guess logically, I mean, prima facie, that is a possibility. I'm not denying that logically that could be possible. All I can say is from my side, <laughs> I look at it from a different point of view. I say there's two things that has caused me to go down a journey of change. And inshallah, I'll continue to go down this journey. Number one, I was forced to take into account worldviews and knowledge genres that I had hitherto ignored in my traditional seminary education. All seminaries concentrate on some topics and ignore many topics. When you enter a Western institution that is reversed, and you must read other topics, and perhaps the topics that you studied are not at the forefront. Reading about the humanities, reading about the various you know, politics and, and media and, and social studies, reading about psychology, understanding different genres is going to influence you. So, I mean, I challenge anybody to read Edward Said's Orientalism and then not start rethinking how they're looking through the world. Entertainment takes on a new worldview. The news takes on a new worldview. Mm -hmm. I mean, reading Foucault, it's not going to change your usul al-tafsir, is it? Mm -hmm. But when you understand genealogies of knowledge, coupled with even a basic understanding of the evolution of Western thought, the problems of enlightenment, post-enlightenment, post-modernism, all of a sudden you're going to help see. You can't help but see the encroachment of liberalism and have a different you know, worldview. Again, I mean, thinking about Rawls' political theology as veils of ignorance, it'll help you convey, it'll help you construct your arguments in a different manner. And perhaps somebody from a pure seminary background is going to say, what is this guy talking about? You know, But you're not, you're not talking to them. You're talking to a broader society. And frankly, dare I say, dare I say, there's a lot to benefit in ulum outside of the ulum of the seminary, even when it comes to preaching and teaching Islam. I mean, if you want to be a thinker in the modern world, uh, a religious thinker, how can you not benefit from Alistair McIntyre? And, and, and how can you not absorb some of his own critiques of the Western you know, hedonism mm -hmm. and then Islamicize it, obviously Islamicize it, but, but, but echo some of those same arguments. So the first point that I would say has changed me, I'll, to, to, to be more well-read, to, to read about especially history. I had zero knowledge of history. I mean, obviously, Sira is separate, but zero knowledge of actual history, you know, in, 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 in the seminary I was at. I mean, how to say this gently, you are not taught history in any Islamic seminary. You are taught, whatever you're taught, hagiography, semi-mythic epics of the past. It's not analytical history. So, 
anybody who is interested in seeing a different Yasir Qadi, listen to my library chats. Listen to that type of analysis. And you will see it's a different type of knowledge. It's not, you know, it's not a corruption. It's actually an advancement of knowledge. But see, it's not just book knowledge. My second, I would say, cause for change. Books only take you so far. Hmm. And experience teaches you what books will never teach you. You have to understand the Yasir Qadi of 30 years ago was a Yasir Qadi of Medina. Never active with the public. Never engaged in national dialogue. Never, I hadn't traveled the world. Alhamdulillah, I'm now speaking with you having visited more than 50 countries. I thank Allah, I didn't just go through the ivory towers. I did go through the ivory tower, but I don't live there. I don't. I went through it. I have access to their books. I was, I was definitely introduced to genres of knowledge, but I move beyond that. Dare I say, I don't know of any other public preacher who travels more to England, Canada, and America than I do and interacts with the people and diverse groups of people. That's another thing. When I came back from Medina, I purposely went out of my shell of just religious Muslims, which is typically the shell of many ulama, that they just want their madrasa students. I, I broke my own shell that I had, my own bubble. Started interacting with wealthy people, politicians, powerful you know, CEOs, lay people, and people of different groups, different understandings. When you do this and you engage in deep dialogue with people of all different backgrounds, all of a sudden, you cannot be simplistic. You cannot be black and white. The world is not in black and white. There's color. And so you start speaking in nuance. You bring in exceptions. You, you, you raise the bar of discourse. And in the process, those who want simplistic sound bites can explain you away as saying, oh, he's been corrupted by the kufars of the academy. I mean, I guess... It appeases, you know, their own intellectual conscience and understanding. That's not the way I look at it. To, I mean, it's a very deep question. It's a personal question. I want to conclude on a personal note. Yeah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly, constantly for hidayah. Yeah. I ask Allah azza wa jalla, the dua of the Prophet that, uh, uh, Oh Allah, guide me to the truth of that which your servants have differed over. This is a constant dua for me. You always ask Allah for hidayah. We're living in unprecedented times. We're facing unprecedented challenges. As somebody who does not believe in copying and pasting from 50 years ago, much less 500 years ago for modern problems, as somebody who doesn't believe that Ibn Taymiyyah is going to solve every problem we have today, I don't believe this, or Ibn Abdul Wahhab, or Maududi, or Sayyid Qutb, or Hassan al-Banna, or Nibhani, anybody you want. As somebody who believes Every generation has to rise up to its challenges. And I hope I'm doing that for our time and place. I'll be the first to say, when you go where nobody has gone before, you're going to get lost. You're going to trip. You're going to fall. You're going to make mistakes. It's inevitable. So my dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that my correct opinions and benefit is much, much, much more than the mistakes I'm inevitably going to make. And my Generic advice to my critics and others, if I fall, if I slip up, and it's a genuine fall or slip up, make dua that Allah forgives me. Inshallah, look at overall the benefit and good. Cover up the mistakes of your brother. And if it's a gray area, which is, I would say, the bulk of the positions people disagree with, and you understand that this is not black and white, well then, agree to disagree. And frankly, don't listen to me. I'm not asking. Wallahi, I'm not, I don't care about the quantity of fault. It doesn't, but I know that large groups of people, you know, they want a type of modern solutions to problems that they're not hearing from other people. And that's why some of my talks and lectures are maybe so beneficial and popular. And I ask Allah to forgive my faults and whatnot. Uh -huh. So for those that are interested, I'm catering to them. For those that are happy following their teachers and scholars, I say to them, remain happy. No problem. But don't take fellow Muslims as your enemies. And I guess to conclude, then I also have to leave. I know it's been a long while. Okay. But let there be some diversity of thought. As I said, go back to my first question. Yeah. There should be a spectrum where you don't just tolerate. You don't just allow to exist. You genuinely respect. I ask Allah Azza wa Jalla for hidayah and ikhlas and ask for all of us that we have an acceptance of what is allowed to, to, to differ. Well, Jazakallah, it's been a pleasure uh, speaking to you today, uh, Dr. Yasir Qadi. 
Pleasure is mine. Jazakumullah. And, and when are you next? When are you next in the UK? Seven, eight days. I'm coming for a Sira tour. Oh, great. And also, I'm teaching a, a tour on modern subjects as well. So we're going to discuss living Islam in the modern world. Um, so I have uh, classes in England. Log on to my Facebook and Twitter. England. I mean, England. Uh, uh, Manchester, Bradford, London. And I believe Birmingham, but, but Birmingham? I've been okay. to England so many times, yeah. all the cities are a blur to me. I don't know where I'm going, but <laughs> I'm coming in a few days. I'll be there, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, inshallah. We'll have a safe journey, and inshallah, we maybe we'll meet, inshallah, when, you, when you're here, and we'll share some fish and chips together, inshallah. Definitely. It's always on my to-do list. Fish and chips is one of the main reasons I come uh, to England, <laughs> of course, to meet with all of you as well. But jazakumullah khair for Allah having Allah me, Allah. and I appreciate the, um, uh, the, 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 the difficult questions. I appreciate the gentle pushback, which is necessary. People who have public opinions like my own, we should be challenged, but we should be challenged from within the paradigm of adab as you are doing. No mm -hmm. problem, inshallah. And we could be right and wrong, but I appreciate this opportunity to be on such a, uh, a show and I wish you all the best. And inshallah, until next time, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. Barakallah fiqh. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah. Please remember to subscribe to our social media and YouTube channels and head over to our website, thinkinmuslim.com to sign up to my weekly newsletter. Jazakallah khair.